Okay, now that everyone is uh, assembled, let's, let's go ahead and start this session, the first for our afternoon session. Uh, this is called PR in the Press and uh, playfully titled, only playfully titled, <laughs> 10 Things I Hate About You. And our moderator, Joe Pan, uh, also an AEJ member, is going to introduce the, his panelists. And uh, I think we're going to have a fun and lively uh, debate here. So, uh, Joe, take it away. Okay, I know it's the afternoon and right after lunch, so just to make it interesting uh, for the introductions, instead of just reading off the bio on what is already published, I want to introduce the panelists by giving, sharing some interesting facts of each of them uh, without saying their names and let you guys to guess who that is and then we go back to ask the journalists uh, and the panelists uh, to share a little bit about the facts and why, why, uh, what the career highlights and so give a minute so make it interesting and I will also make it interesting for the audience as I will give the prize, give our prize for a book that uh, on an uh, interesting book and a surprise to the first one who can match all the names. So, and then, uh, but before that I want to set the ground rule and this discussion is really a panel discussion involving you and the audience uh, with our panelists and really want to get the, all the experts who have years and years of experience in their trade to share some tips and really practical advice and for you. So there will be point of discourse and uh, fun facts about you know, what I hate about you, hopefully not 10 things or even five things or even one thing, but they, they can definitely share some anecdotes uh, about their trade. And then we hope to have some uh, lively discussions. And the whole thing is if you can walk away today with one practical advice and tips to how you can deal with the other side, and that will be the success uh, and the measure of success, and I've done my job. So first, starting with our first panelist. Uh, the panelist and the mother of the panelists were in China, and matter of fact, in Beijing in June 4th, and they were instrumental in smuggling a tape that shot by ABC broadcast news crew of the actual crackdown of the Tiananmen Square, and because the mother of the panelists believe that security at the airport is like, less likely to search a child of 12 year old. So the tape was with this panelist and smuggled out and therefore it was broadcast through ABC and the world was able to see the live and moving image of the whole crackdown. So that's our first panelist, okay? You can guess who that is, okay? And the second, second panelist uh, worked for a number of major daily paper and had a close and up and personal experience with Prince Charles. Okay. Uh, so that's, I, I'll let the panelists explain later on. So that's what will make it interesting, right? So we can ask, okay. And our third panelist is known as a lucky star or quote unquote lucky star in certain circles because Financial crisis has followed him, or followed this panelist, so <laughs> slip up there. Oh. All right, that's an obvious giveaway. All right, never mind on that one. So, and for financial crisis has followed him twice during his career, whenever he was posted at the financial center of the world trade or financial center. So, okay, our final panelist um, was the star of his, um, uh, his class, Oh, I'm sorry, not his class. The panelist was a very, had a degree from a top U.S. institution. And, um, okay, uh, and speaks fluent Mandarin. And I'm, I'm going to stop right there, so before I give away more stuff. So, okay, anyway, anyone, uh, I'm going to give a consolation prize for first one who's going to try. And even though you cannot name and match all of them, I personally brought a pick some lychee from China just the other day. I can't bring it in the auditorium. It's sitting outside, so at least whoever is going to walk away with a bag of lychee and the grand prize will be a book uh, on how to write uh, with clarity. So, so you anyway. picked it yourself? Yeah, I picked it myself. Very impressed. From a farm two days ago. So, okay, anyone who wants to give, me, uh, give it a try. And so here you have. Any, anyone want to take a guess? Gentleman with the hat? Tiananmen. She's speaking Chinese, okay. All right, so you're saying 
Juliana is the one that smuggled the tapes out of uh, for Tiananmen Square live footage uh, shot by ABC crew. Okay, and Chelsea here is the one with a close and up personal contact with Prince Charles. Okay, and then Jennifer here is speaks Chinese and speaks Mandarin, fluent Mandarin. Well, I think uh, we got one out of three. So at least you got the back of Lee Chi, so it's good, good to go. Okay. So anyone want to have a second try? The second one will be the grand fastest, so it should be easy then. He was right about uh, Chelsea. I'm sorry. That didn't, didn't mention. Chelsea is at one. Um, you got to share about that incident with, uh, with Prince Charles. Anyone else want to give a try? Okay, the other two didn't get it right, but it's the other way around. So, so I, why don't I hand, it to, uh, the, hand the mic to Jennifer to tell and share your, yourself and a little bit about yourself and especially the Tiananmen Square live footage and then so the audience know about you. Sure, well, it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, I hope you're a friendly audience because I'm probably outnumbered today. Um, but. Needless to say, being involved or being a spectator of so many world events, um, I have a theory my mother foments unrest. We were living in the Philippines during the People Power Revolution. We were in China for Tiananmen. So I think she's the common factor that causes trouble. Um, but where is it she got, now? She, where is she now? She's in Portland, Oregon, where amazingly nothing is happening. She's 80 years old and still, still stirring up problems. Exactly. Yeah. But witnessing so much history in, in the making and realizing how important uh, journalists were in communicating the story made me really want to be a journalist. Um, I did an interview at the Wall Street Journal after uh, graduate school in New York. Uh, they gave me the salary offer and um, I had graduate school loans and undergraduate loans. So that's how I ended up in PR. It was literally because it was the only way I could feed myself. But what I like about my job is that I see my role as being much more uh, partnership oriented than confrontational. I'm not a gatekeeper, contrary to what people may believe. So what I do is I work from the other side to get stories told. I've been in this job in 14 years. Um, I currently am Deputy Managing Director of Southeast Asia for APCO Worldwide, based in Jakarta. But I've had the fortune and pleasure of working in mainland China, in Malaysia, and in the United States. So thank you very much. I'm sure you're quite interested to know about the Prince Charles story. Um, it wasn't that up close and personal. In fact, it, he, I think the only thing we said was hi and a handshake and we took a photo. And that was about it. And it was doing because I did an internship at the Singapore High Commission in London during my, one of my years. I, I had done my undergraduate study there. So, not as exciting, but it was my first sort of brush with famous people. But after that, when you become a journalist and you have lots of brushes with famous people, you, you kind of, that kind of, you know, kind of loses its luster. Oh, I'm currently with um, Bell Pottinger. We are a um, UK-based international full suite communications firm. So, I am on the so-called dark side now. Um, but actually, interestingly enough, I, I spend more years being a journalist than on the PR side. So maybe there's a reason why I'm sitting right down the middle now. <laughs> That's right. Juliana? My name is Juliana Liu. I cover Hong Kong and occasionally other parts of Asia for BBC News. Uh, I've been a journalist for all my working life. It's the only thing I've ever really wanted to do. And uh, I've been lucky enough to do it for 12 years. And uh, for the most part, I would say, working with public relations uh, executives and officials in Hong Kong, on the whole, is quite a pleasure. I think that because Hong Kong uh, has such a strong tradition of free press, I think on the whole, uh, people on the dark side do understand what it is that we're trying to do. So it, it tends to be a better relationship than in other places where perhaps media is less free. Uh, or where the goal of media is not necessarily uh, journalism, but is often some form of propaganda. So it, it, you know, the, the experience is, is very different uh, depending on where I am. 
and I've worked with all different kinds of uh, PR professionals, all the way from uh, people whose jobs are to send invitations and to call me seemingly every hour until I tell them I'm not going to come or I will come, uh, all the way to people who are actually very close to what's happening uh, in terms of whatever the story it is that I'm trying to report on. And oftentimes they will, uh, even though their official line is no comment, they will actually brief me very in, in a lot of detail about what's going on. But obviously that happens only when they trust you as journalists and they trust that you will not out their, you know, you, you will not use their name. But this is invaluable, uh, especially when it's quite a big story. Okay, Peter. Uh, my name is Peter Thalarsen. I'm the uh, uh, Asia editor for Reuters Breaking Views, which um, is the commentary arm of commentary opinion arm of, uh, of Reuters. Um, I've also, I was just thinking how long I've been a journalist. It's kind of quite a large number. I think I probably um, won't dwell on it too much, but we just had an anniversary in Hong Kong, um, and that's around the time that I became a journalist, so um, uh, that's quite a long time. Um, I've, uh, I, I, before I was, I was at Reuters, I was at the FT for 10 years, and I worked at various newspapers in the UK. Um, so I've, I've worked in New York, London, and now Hong Kong, which means I've had the, uh, the misfortune of being lied to and dissembled to by uh, members of the corporate communications world uh, in three major financial centers. Um, uh, but also, you know, occasionally had, uh, had, had better exchanges with them as well. Um, uh, I mean, I think we'll get into this in the discussion, but uh, uh, I mean, one thing I will say is that um, uh, five years ago, I, I stopped being a print news reporter and I became a, I became a columnist, um, which has uh, been a big liberation for me really um, because it's allowed me to um, first of all express an opinion more clearly more openly and has also freed me from um, trying to get people to talk on the record uh, or trying to get people to say things on the record when uh, often when you're in the in position where you're actually you're trying to advance an argument which is what I'm often trying to do um, people will talk to you uh, much more openly if they know that you're not going to quote them um, and also, you, it, it changes the power, the, 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 the balance of power in the relationship. Often, as a, as a news reporter, for example, I was uh, I was a, an M and A, a mergers and acquisitions reporter in New York for a while, um, and that you were very much in a position where you're trying to get people who have information to tell it to you. Um, uh, as a columnist, you're very much in a situation where you're basically saying, "I'm going to write about this subject. I have an opinion on this. I'd like to run my opinion by you. If you." can persuade me that I'm wrong or that, you know, kind of I should nuance my view, then that's fine. But I'm going to write about it anyway, so you may as well talk to me, which, uh, is, uh, which can be quite refreshing. Um, but uh, that's about it. Well, thank you for the opening, and I think now kind of set the stage. Um, I think it was alluded to using uh, the dark side, and then so we also mentioned about sitting right, the post, the kind of not alongside each other, and there's a divider line. But that all that is part of the conversation and discussion today. So I would like to start with the first question. How would you describe your relationships with each other? So, for example, I want to ask Peter, how's your, how would you describe your, you describe a little bit, but can you go into a little specific? And if there is any examples of, do you see them as gatekeepers? And Jennifer just mentioned she does not see herself as gatekeeper, but do you see them as a gatekeeper and why? And what's your re general relationship? Well, I know this is called 10 Things I Hate About You, which is uh, the name of, for those of you who don't know, is the name of a romantic comedy starring Julia Stiles and Heath Ledger. So maybe the idea is that we all sort of like kiss at the end of this yeah. or something. Um, <laughs> oh, you just gave away our ending. I'm afraid <laughs> I, that's not going to happen. Um, but, uh, but maybe we can, uh, we can reach some sort of mutual understanding. Um, uh, I mean, I, for me, for me um, the sort of the PR industry uh, in a very narrow sense serves a purpose, which is that... Um, the people I want to talk to uh, most of the time are important, busy people, and they don't always have time to talk to me. So in an ideal world, I would pick up the phone to mm -hmm. the CEO of this bank, you know, this head of state, this person, um, and talk to them directly whenever I wanted to. Um, and realistic, that does sometimes happen, but realistically that is not going to happen all the time. So they sometimes need to have someone to speak to them. And even if they wanted to speak to me, they wouldn't be able to speak to every other media organization that would want to have the same kind of conversation with them. They couldn't do their jobs if they did that. So, so on a practical level, the job of speaking on behalf of an organization has to be outsourced to a certain extent. 
and either internally or externally to someone. Um, and there are people who can do that job very well. There are people who are, who are intelligent, who are well informed about the organization they're representing, um, who can actually act to a certain extent as a sort of proxy for sort of giving you a perspective on things that you would get from speaking to the person in charge. Um, so in that sense, I think, um, I think there's, a, uh, there's a sort of, there's a, there's a function there. Um, what I would say though is, I mean, you talked about gatekeepers versus partners. I mean, it's very clear to me that this is never a partnership, right? We have different objectives. Um, my objective is to, is to write a story or a, or a, or a column or, or kind of, you know, advance a point of view, establish some facts. And, um, and on the other side, you have someone who's trying to represent an organization, an industry, a company, whatever. Um, and those, those interests very rarely overlap entirely. So, and we shouldn't pretend anything different. We want different things. Um, so, and I think generally these things work best when people understand that, that there is a certain, there's a natural sort of adversarial relationship. I was, I was thinking about it earlier as I was walking around Hong Kong this morning, and you almost want to think of it as a love-hate relationship, but actually it's almost like a hate-hate relationship. <laughs> because to a certain extent, um, I, as a journal, we as journalists, kind of realize that we sort of need people in, in, in public relations and corporate communications, uh, but we kind of, we'd rather we didn't. Mm -hmm. um, and I imagine the feeling is probably mutual. Um, but, um, but there is also a certain sort of, uh, a certain sort of interdependency there um, that maybe if people can sort of understand where each side is coming from, that you can at least achieve some sort of like level of civility. Thank you. Um, Peter, I'm going to ping pong back to our PR kind of that professional. How about just specifically Chelsea? Um, Peter just kind of described the mutual feelings, whether it's hey, love, hey, or kind of symbiotic in a way that you need each other. But you, uh, a lot of times I'm sure from the PR professionals, when you handle or arrange an engagement, and at the time there's a certain amount of preparation you have to do. So tell me what Peter just describes that in case there is a arrangement. Do you see what's, what you're talking about, that, that this is a, a way that you actually are proactively arranging this and then you need him more than, or the other way around, that uh, they're going to be reaching out to you? How do you move that process along without incurring that whole love and hate relationship? I think there's a few things here to um, point out. I do agree that there is an inherent conflict or you say adversarial kind of relationship. But I think what's key here is um, mutual respect and trust and how we, we work around that. Um, we all, I mean, whether we are journalists or PR or doing our different jobs, everyone comes in with an agenda. And um, what essentially, when, when we do call up journalists for stories or to highlight something, or, you know, I mean, with mainly for our clients usually, is what we're essentially doing is we're offering one, only one perspective. And um, I do not agree that any PR person should, we're not going to strong, strong arm any journalist into writing only our perspective. But what we do offer you is one perspective, which is our clients. Um, but there's no stopping you from going out there and getting the other perspective. And, you know, in fact, in, in fact, I think that makes for a better story. And having been a journalist, um, that's how I, I saw it when I was a journalist as well. Okay. Yeah, that's... Juliana, do you have something to I add think, to that? Uh, I think, Peter, you're right, that there's no pretending that everyone has the same objective all the time. Uh, but sometimes, uh, sometimes the objective on both sides do overlap to a great extent and those tend to be the easiest stories to work on. And I've been both a print and a television journalist, and I can say that it's very, the dynamic is very different because when you're a print journalist, uh, you may be searching mostly for access to an individual or a location, but if you don't get it, it's not usually the end of the world. You can still do the story. Uh, you can probably speak to, you can probably get people off the record, or you know, there are many, many ways of getting a story even if you don't have that access. With television, it's very different because you need the pictures and you do need the access. And if you don't have those pictures, you really don't have a story. And, and it's, it's difficult to tell it in a visual way. So 
you know, you, you can probably still do the story, uh, but you would have to do it very, in a very different way. So instead of uh, a, a video picture package, which you know tends to look really nice and tends to be very engaging, I might have to pop up on the, on, on TV on the radio and just talk about it, which can work well, but sometimes it's it's kind of second best. So uh, definitely working in television, uh, you you do have to work with PR a lot more, mm -hmm. and I think a lot of times uh, it's true you have to understand that there are different objectives, very different objectives, and perhaps this part of the shoot that this part of the filming that I would really, really like may be off limits, and I have to decide whether or not it's still worth going ahead with the story. So that's a decision that I have to make. But, you know, I, I completely accept that, uh, you know, there are certain uh, instances where I, I, I will not get what I want, I cannot get what I want, and it's not usually the PR person, it's, us it's usually the client. Uh, a very savvy PR person can oftentimes convince the client why this is necessary. Uh, but I also accept that not everyone has that level of trust with the client, uh, and it's just not possible. So I, I do accept that. Do I like that? No. But this is the real world. Well, Juliana mentioned several times the word access. So Jennifer, when you're opening, you said that you don't see yourself as a gatekeeper, but definitely the other side needs access. So how do you handle that, and how do you turn around that saying, you know, I'm not controlling the access, I'm handing, so, so go ahead. Well, I'd like to begin by just commenting that I think PR people have the same reputation as tourists, which is the really obnoxious ones are the ones that stand out in your mind. Um, there's a lot more to our jobs than just making persistently annoying phone calls. Um, part of my job as a senior person is I talk to these executives and I coach them not only on why it's important for their business success to be in the media, but also how to say things that make both sides look good. Every once in a while there's a great gotcha interview, you know, uh, Tony Hayward from BP saying, I just want my life back. But more often than not, you risk getting dead air or something that is just so dull and useless that it serves neither party well. So part of what we do to provide access is make our clients comfortable. If they know they're going to speak smartly, they're much more willing to face the media than if they are worried that there's gonna be a gotcha moment. And then secondly, really making sure they understand what is newsworthy and what's not, and how you put your best foot forward for both parties. Thank you, Jennifer. So I'll go back to Peter, so now we, move past the access and we actually talking to each other and now we let's say we're actually going to conduct an inter interview and normally you would be asked say do you have any questions do you can you give us a questions list so how do you feel about sometimes a lot of times they say can you send us your your kill list kill list how, how do I, you i have to say people very rarely ask me that okay. and when they do i tell them they can't have one okay um i mean i know there's sort of Sometimes when you're dealing with sort of companies in China who have a slightly different mm -hmm. attitude or, or idea of what to expect from the media, you get this sort of, you get this kind of idea or, you know, kind of, can we have your questions? Mm -hmm. Can we check your quotes? Can you fax us a list of questions, et cetera, et cetera? Um, I mean, I, I don't see the point in doing that. Um, but also, as I said, I'm, 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 I'm in the sort of, I'm in the privileged position of being where I don't actually need to quote anybody. Okay. And so I'm really, just, I'm trying, I'm interested in kind of trying to form an argument. Mm -hmm. um, and people who want to engage on those terms, I can have an interesting conversation with them. And they might be able to persuade me that a, my initial view is wrong. Um, but it's a completely different okay. kind of, it's a completely different relationship in that sense. Interesting. And Juliana, so if there were uh, questions. Well, actually, me, yeah, question BBC with. being the organization that it is, we actually have a producer's mm -hmm. guidelines handbook. So mm -hmm. basically, uh, we're, we don't send out a list of questions, mm -hmm. but we are fair to the interviewee in the sense that we are very clear uh, about the nature of the contribution. Mm -hmm. We're very clear about the subject that we're talking about. Mm -hmm. uh, we very rarely will completely surprise someone. Mm -hmm. And if so, if we do that, then there's actually in the background a huge kind of editorial, uh, it becomes quite bureaucratic. Basically, mm -hmm. I have to uh, you know, write down why I'm doing that, and mm -hmm. someone very senior has to approve it. So it's quite, it's quite systematic uh, when we do that kind of interview, and, it's, and it's, it doesn't happen that often. 
Uh, but usually, you know, I, I want uh, most most of the interviews that I do. I want the person who's interviewed to appear effective for television. Uh, that means that on the on the whole, I want them to be sure of what they're saying because for the most part, you're getting a sound bite. For the most part, you're trying to get a sound bite if, if mm -hmm. this is recorded. And you know, I'm fairly clear about what the subject is, mm -hmm. how their contribution will be used. Uh, I may also uh, be very uh, clear about what other viewpoints will be represented. Uh, so we try to be fair, is what I'm trying to say. Mm -hmm. I, I don't like to give a list of questions right. because I find that to be, I actually don't think that helps with the preparation because they try to memorize what mm -hmm. they're going to say and mm -hmm. then you can't have a conversation anymore because they're thinking one, two, three, four, five, six. So I don't like to give a list of questions, but I'll be very clear exactly for which purpose you are serving in this piece. Because that, that's, you know, I'm, I'm basically casting someone, yeah. usually. You, know, you are representing this point of view. Very good. So what she back. said. Yeah. So coming back to the, this side, so how do you prepare your clients and then making sure they're not nervous about it or being surprised by uh, questions that, that they don't want to answer. This must be difficult because television is scary, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Television, I mean, when you do it all, all the, the time, right. when you do it all the time, right. you get so used to it, you mm -hmm. know, and you can do it almost to sleep. But you forget, I mean, I forget sometimes that... How scary it's it is. It's quite, it's, well, you, you know, even people who've been doing this for years and years mm -hmm. still get really scared. Mm -hmm. You know, and before the camera starts rolling, they'll ask, what are the questions? Mm -hmm. You know, are you gonna, please don't ask me something that I don't know. And I'm thinking, you've been doing this for 25 years. You're still, you know, you're still nervous. So, so whose job it is to ease that person, the subjects, and be able to be able to relax and really go into a really good session. So that's good. You get the sound bite and they get the message in. I guess, it was, well, you know, essentially it's the PR person's job, but also I think that's where the relationship comes in that's quite important. Because if the PR person has a good relationship with the journalist and they have mutual trust and respect, um, I think that the, the journalist can kind of prep, prep the client, the person who's beyond, going to be the newsmaker, to let them know that, you know, hey, journalist is okay, she's a human being, she will ask you, she probably will go on this angle, like you will give a broad angle of what, what the story is about, not necessarily the specific questions. And about giving a, a list of cues, um, a lot of clients will ask us to do that. And sometimes we will, and it, different, it differs from markets to markets. In Singapore, um, usually the journalists will. Um, they may not give you their whole list of questions they want to ask, but they will give you some. And what we will say is that, I mean, we, we don't, uh, what we give is we'll give pointers. Right? We don't give them paragraphs to memorize, we give them pointers. Just they still try, don't they? They still and try. You can, you can see it, and you're like, no, yeah. no, no. And we tell them that's something that if they're properly trained, mm -hmm. they shouldn't do that. Yeah. Because then it will look very unnatural. Um, and that's, then it doesn't really look good for them too on TV as so. well. Okay. I want to go back to Peter. As you, you're in a privileged kind of position, be able to write commentary. So have anyone or any in the past, that, well, either PR side of it or there's some specific uh, commentary that you wrote, they were not happy about it and they call you or they how? Had that ever happened? Tell us. Well, I think yeah, no, that's an interesting question, and I was just thinking about this in the context of um, of the BBC guidelines. I mean, obviously, uh, uh, you know, we're writing opinions, it's quite different, but, mm -hmm. but we're not. You know, people sometimes think we don't actually talk to anybody. I mean, we're actually, but we're, we're talking to people a lot. We just don't quote them. Um, and one of the things, one of the sort of important guidelines, um, is that basically we think you need to basically have whatever argument it is you're going to present, you need to present it to the person you're writing about mm -hmm. beforehand. So you basically need to, so if you, so if, as I did about two or three years ago, um, uh, I basically argued that Bob Diamond should be fired as chief executive of Barclays, which was kind of a big call at the time. Um, and we, one of the things we had to do was we had to call Barclays and say, we are planning to write, you know, we're planning to write a view that says, Bob Diamond should be fired as chief executive for these reasons. And we basically had to make sure that Bob Diamond and Barclays had an opportunity to mm -hmm. uh, put their point of view, to uh, persuade us, mm -hmm. just to say, well, we might have made a mistake, or we might have got something wrong, or we might have got the wrong opinion, or whatever. Um, and they did that. I mean, obviously, we still went with the, with the, with the mm -hmm. argument, but the, 
the important point, the, the sort of the principle there is, is a sort of no surprises principle, mm -hmm. which is, um, which sounds, in some ways, sounds, sound, you know, people might say, well, that's very kind of lame, actually. You're kind of giving this guy a, a heads up about what you're going to write about him. But it's also very important because we, actually, we have a duty to be accurate and to be sort of, and to take on board all the, all the information that, that is out there. And you never have all the information. So if you're going to write something critical about someone, the best thing you can do is ring them up and say, I'm going to write this critical thing, and it's going to say A, B, C, D. Um, and make sure that you have given them an opportunity to respond to that before you publish it. If you wait until after you publish, then they ring up and they scream at you, and they demand a correction, and they kind of, you know, sort of, you know, call your editor and whatever, and make life very uncomfortable. And if you've got anything wrong, any small thing wrong, they will use that against you. They will use that to undermine the entire argument. So it's very important that you get your facts completely straight if you're doing something like that. And once you've got your facts completely straight and you've told them what you're saying, then you publish it and there's nothing they can do. They can, I mean, they won't like it. They can ring up and say, we don't like it and we're never talking to you again and you know, I'm going to complain to your editor about you and all that kind of stuff, which is sort of the usual kind of, um, usual kind of behavior. But, um, uh, but, the, but the important principle is as long as they know that you're going to tell them what you're doing before you do it, then that sort of establishes at least a sort of a baseline. Thank you. And back to our side here. Do you, Peter just mentioned they mean there are certain reactions that come with the commentary that you like it or you don't like it, and you even sometimes say we'll never talk to you or complain. How, has that ever happened on your sides, and you complain to the next level, or how did that come about? Any, uh, Jennifer or? Yes, that has happened. Um, I have only called to complain about factual errors. The first thing I do when I talk to any of my clients is I say that they are accountable for anything that comes out of their mouth. And unless it's CCTV, there's no way I can call and get things magically edited away. <laughs> I mean, that's point number I did one. I tips for everyone. <laughs> um, point number two, and I'm sorry to tell you guys this, but I tell my clients that the journalist questions don't matter. It's kind of like what Juliana said. It's not about memorizing answers to questions. It's about the story you want to tell, the point of view you have, and the perspective that you can provide on a situation. When you present a media interview in that context, it becomes much less academic. You know, we're kind of trained to think the teacher asks you a question, you answer. But media is storytelling. And when you get someone feeling that they're in control of their story, you have less of these slip ups. But I believe PR professionals from the beginning need to tell their clients that's a no, that's, that's a no go. We cannot m magically wish things away that had happened in an interview. Yes, I agree with a lot of that. Um, and yes, I would only call to correct factual error. And in fact, sometimes um, I would only, if it's a really small factual error, I won't even demand a paper correction. Um, we'll just say, just, you know, correct it for your files um, because we need to pick and choose our battle. And in Singapore, for the press, it's, it's not good when they have a lot of paper corrections that kind of eats into their bonuses and things like that. So um, we also try to be understanding from that point of view. Um, the other thing is I wanted to add to the part where we talked about um, um, access and, you know, getting um, um, to know each other in a sense. Well, what I usually try to tell clients is, you know, you, it's always, I always encourage them to meet with journalists and to have in-person interviews because especially if we know that the journalist might write a story that is not very favorable, because once you meet the person, sometimes it's very hard to be nasty. <laughs> um, not telling them today have to charm the socks off the journalist, but it, it is a way to kind of diffuse a bit of that um, hostility, or maybe the journalist is going with an angle that we feel is not very fair. Um, that's one way of kind of you know, talking through things. Um, and it, yeah, we can't, and, and in the end, you know, sometimes the, the client would say, I, got, I thought it's going to be a positive story. And we say, well, in the beginning it was going to be a negative story, but because you've talked to the journalist, at least now you've offered your point of view, and it's a neutral, it's a balanced, neutral story. 
we can't if it's going to be a negative story it is what it is right it's not we can't magically like make turn it into a positive story yeah sure so the other thing that i just thought of is we have a really unique advantage because we look at this as an adversarial relationship but every single one of my clients is a consumer of news which means my client knows a story that he or she thinks is just a fluff piece that is completely useless and a really hard-hitting story. So when you start contextualizing their media experience in terms of the news that they're reading about others, it becomes a lot easier to understand that process. Okay, maybe uh, questions for Juliana. Um, Chelsea mentioned a couple words repeating, say, know the journalist. And I know it's a common practice. A lot of times we uh, meet the journalist and then also we may sometimes even have a few drinks. But how do you contextualize the whole process of media relation? Actually, do you see them as friends? Uh, do you actually develop meaningful friendships? Do you ever become friends with uh, PR people, Peter and Juliana? Uh, I would say yes, sometimes, in, mm -hmm. in the sense that I become friends with, you know, I could be friends with anyone. Mm -hmm. uh, but that doesn't always translate into uh, a different way of working. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think it does help communication. Uh, for example, the BBC has a very complex structure, uh, generally. <laughs> uh, but you know, it, it can have a, a kind of a complex structure with many different programs, uh, air times, uh, different programs for different markets. And often, a lot of my job is explaining that uh, to, to, you know, a lot of that explaining that to people who may have story ideas, uh, because I might be able to say, look, I'm really busy. This is a good idea, but it's maybe not for me. It's for this particular program. I think would be interested. So, you know, uh, yeah, I, I do spend a fair amount of time explaining that to people, and I just think that's good for everyone involved because the programs get what they want, uh, you know, and. And the client maybe gets, uh, you know, gets some airtime. So that doesn't really hurt anyone, I think. Peter? I do have friends who are PR people, uh, a few of them. Um, uh, slipped through the net. No, um, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, look, I mean, it's, it's about personal relationships. So, I mean, obviously, you know, you kind of, you can't sort of be uh, uh, religious about, about who you can become friends with. But, um, but I think, I think, I think there is a tendency sometimes for these relationships to become sort of overly chummy, and I think, mm. um, uh, and I think, I think often, you know, I mean, I think coming back to to to, to your point about um, about journalists, I think actually journalists, I think journalists often sell themselves short. I think there's a sort of people almost like they almost sort of they they rein themselves in, or they sort of you know they kind of like they pull their punches. Because they're worried about sort of you know kind of getting criticism or, or upsetting people or, or kind of you know kind of getting some kind of negative feedback. I mean the point is sometimes you just don't realize actually how powerful you are, um, and you have to take advantage of that of that position um, and not kind of get caught up with sort of thinking oh you know is this person going to be angry with me if I if I kind of you know I print something that's accurate. It's about being fair, isn't it? It's about it's about being able to uh, defend your argument and the story that you've uh, that you've put out. Okay. Well, at this time, um, if you want to share the ten things, or five things, or one things, uh, you're welcome to share and uh, open to the panel. And at the same time, if you have questions, uh, feel free to start raising your hands and I'll prepare those. And I'll go through the. You actually did you actually prepare any? points and say uh, 10 things or five things? Not 10. No. Okay, so um, Jennifer can prepare. And I'm going to do a really clever PR thing. I'm going to start with a mea culpa. Mm. Our job, we need to train our people how to pitch. I really empathize when you have people who call and are wasting your time with stupid, boring, horrible opportunities and don't stop calling you. So I empathize a lot. But here's what I need from you, and here's one of the things that drives me nuts. Why do you guys guard your information more closely than Fort Knox? If I knew 
who the right person was to contact about a story if I knew your preferred form of contact. I have a personal database, so the journalists I know, I list down who likes SMSs, who likes emails, who likes phone calls, who loves email attachments, who hates email attachments. But this is 15 years of work in the making. If you guys could just put it all out there, I cover this beat, I'm interested in this, contact me this way, you'll get a lot fewer of those annoying calls. Just a little food for thought there. Now, what happens sometimes is that you are so, so gung-ho about trying to pitch a story that you don't realize what that story is, that it really is not interesting at all. And so you fabricate these things to the point where we take interest in it, and then when we come to find out, the reality is that it's not a story. You've wasted our time. Me personally, if you have that experience with me? Yeah, it's just talking about that year. So. And that's where the training comes in, and that's exactly key. Because if you train people to push back the clients and say, this story is not news, and if you teach people how to pitch a genuine lead to the right person, you don't have these Just like not all journalists are the same, not, our PR, not all PR professionals are the same. I think it helps for ex-journalists to be in PR profession because then you would know, oh, that's really a stupid story. Like your client would tell, come to you and say, oh, you know, we're having a launch of this blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, this is like this umpteen times they're doing it. Like, I don't think it's news and seriously, nobody. I mean, I can pitch it, I can write a news release for you, just don't expect any coverage. That's what I would say to them. And it's like, yes, Bobby. Mm -hmm. and I'm, I'm oh, yeah, hit me. <laughs> you know, I used to always be nice to PR people, right? You weren't so nice to PR people. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Uh, should have a little interesting fact well, there. I, I, always, I always try to be nice. <laughs> I always try to be nice because... No, but I'm, I'm interested now, uh, Chelsea, um, being the journalist that you were, I mean, what are some of the things that you think that uh, um, I, as a journalist, still a journalist, uh, annoys the heck out of you that you used to do? I think I was a very nice and good journalist. <laughs> well, I... I think that um, essentially what, what I don't understand is when I was a journalist, I always picked up my phone. So when I try to call journalists and they never picked, especially editors, and they never picked up their phone, they're never at the desk, so they, they're nev never, you know, picking up their mobiles. That's what I don't really understand because I'm thinking, you know, do you not want to have news? <laughs> um, yeah, because that's the, I actually fret about me missing phone calls and missing tips when I was a journalist. So that's one thing I don't really understand from the other side right now. But I also work in a different market. Just to explain, like when I was in the US, um, I, I mean, I was a journalist mostly in the US, but now when I'm back in Singapore, I'm doing a PR site. So there is a there is slight difference. Um, it's more competitive in the States, which, is, which maybe explains why m journalists are more inclined to pick up their phones. Whereas in Singapore, you know, it's not so much competition. Um, should I go on? <laughs> um, well, I think that the others, you, you, I, I, saw, I saw Peter has a list, and so you're going to... I don't have a hate list, though. Yeah, a hate list. But I mean, I have to just go back to the point earlier. I mean, I used to have a, uh, I used to have a rule for myself, which was that I re would reply to every email. Uh, I ditched that rule about six, seven years ago. Uh -huh. It just became impossible. And, and this idea that somehow you know, kind of, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm in all these databases, uh, uh, you know, kind of, in theory, people can go and look and see what I do. They can, I mean, everything that I publish is available online. You know, it, it, it takes five minutes to, for, for an intelligent person to figure out what my, what I'm interested in and what I write about. I still get, I get absolute nonsense all the time. I mean, every day. I, I got invited the other day to something, uh, to, to an event in London from someone. And I replied and said, oh, it's going to be a bit tricky for me because I live in Hong Kong now. And, uh, you know, this person obviously just hadn't even noticed that I'd moved. Because um, it's so easy to send an email. So I think, I don't know. I mean, the, one, one of the great things about being a columnist is you don't get pitched on sort of story ideas so much, which is 
another big advantage. But actually, I was just, I, th I thought rather than sort of, you know, kind of um, a whinge back about Yelp as well, I thought, thought maybe it would be to, good to have some advice for, for the journalists in the room um, in, terms of, in terms of how to sort of get the most out of this. Um, and really, I think there are three things. I think the first thing is you have to be prepared. So you have to know your subject, you have to have done your homework, you have to have, so that when you get on the phone, and by the way, get on the phone. Don't do it by email. Get on the phone, get people on the phone, because that way they have to talk to you uh, and they actually have to adjust your, your questions. And you can also tell when they're, when they're um, uh, you know, kind of if they're sort of trying to dissemble or whatever. Whereas email, it's a lot harder. But, so, but be prepared, if, you, if, you, if you've prepared your subject, then um, you're, you're less likely to be fobbed off. And also you're more likely to, find, to, to get to the point with someone where they say, okay, you're asking questions at a level of detail that I'm not able to answer. I'm gonna go and find someone to talk to you about this. And you get beyond that, you get to the next stage. So, and if, if you haven't really done, if you haven't read the press release, if you haven't read the, the, late, the last statement, if you haven't got the numbers straight, uh, you're more likely to get fobbed off. Um, second thing is to just be persistent you know as i said again if these the, the, you know what we think is a story is not necessarily what the, 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 the organization that you're writing about thinks is a story or wants out there about them as a story and they're all the usual tricks which i'm sure you'll recognize of sort of saying oh you want to write about that oh that's an old story oh your rival did that last week oh you know God, i don't can't believe anybody's really interested in this you know all that kind of stuff keep pushing right so and basically don't be don't take no for an answer. And third, I think especially, I mean, we haven't really talked about this very much, but, but in a sort of, in an online world, I think also you have to be prepared just to publish. You basically have to be prepared to just say, okay, I've, I've pushed as hard as I can. I've tried, I've got as much information as I can. It's not complete. I'm aware of the holes in my story, but I will publish it. I will be clear about what it is that I don't know. And I will basically say to people, here's what I know at the moment and I'm prepared to update this with further information. Because I think one of the things that has happened, and this is a, a sort of, in, especially in the analog world, uh, has been a big problem is that companies are basically hidden behind the no comment, especially in the US, especially in the US where, where standards of journalism, frankly, are pretty high, and, and where you kind of have to get comments off people. You have to kind of, so people just think, I can say no comment, and the story won't happen. So I think there comes a point where you have to basically say, I've got enough here to publish something, and, um, and then when, once you press the button, then sometimes, you know, more information comes out, people kind of respond, suddenly someone releases a statement, et cetera, et cetera. And you say, okay, I'm prepared to update that. Actually, I think, I believe that no comment should be banned. <laughs> um, yes, that's why I tell my clients that, you know, it's really not, it doesn't look good on you when you say no comment. And if the journalist is going to write a story, you're going to write it with or without your input. Um, so we, we, then we think of different ways to say no comment. So essentially we are... The, the lady over there has a question. I actually had a comment. I work for Bloomberg uh, TV. I'm producing interviews for one of uh, our morning shows. I totally agree with Peter. Uh, I think um, it's for us as a um, journalist, we can never promise uh, things and we have to manage our expectations. And um, I just wanted to say, um, I'm sorry, what, what was your name again? Jennifer. Chelsea, yeah. You said like uh, a lot of times, you know, you were always picking up phone calls. I actually, from seven till noon, I'm basically writing, you know, introduc uh, questions, I mean, updating, uh, interviews, uh, creating graphics, and it's really, really hard to pick up the phone. So I think knowing uh, your comp knowing um, where you send the pitch and um, what time and also timing, it, timing, it's really, really important. Because if I have, if, if you uh, call me about some random, you know, um, story and it's all about MH370 or it's all about abenomics. There is no way I can sell it to my team. Uh, th it, you can send me the best pitch ever and I will just ditch it, you know. I just have to. So basically, uh, one of the very imp most important things is timing. And if you can, uh, you know, find the right time to call that person and also the story is uh, somehow links to what's going on. 
you have the way there, basically. Yes, um, yes, we agree. With, I agree with that. Um, so that's again knowing your journalists, having that relationship, knowing when's the best time to call. Um, especially with editors, when they go into their news meetings, you would, you don't want to be calling them at that time, you know. Um, yeah, knowing when people have their downtime. But what I'm referring to is even when you do know when is the best time to call them, and they just never ever pick up their phone. That is when it gets very frustrating. Maybe they know you're calling. <laughs> All yes, right, maybe have, I'm uh, not getting the message. A few minutes, and we got some hands. So this one, uh, the lady. Hi, um, I'm Sue Jeff. I'm the South China Morning Post. Um, and as a young journalist, I've been told um, quite a number of times: you go to the press conference, and the only story is the story that they don't want you to tell. So um, I wonder what you guys think of this kind of. Uh, almost a little bit hostile mentality <laughs> towards the, the PR uh, side. Um, and, and then my second question is for Jennifer. Um, I agree with um, most of what she said, but coming back to what she said about you being a gatekeeper instead of, uh, uh, of you not being a gatekeeper, but rather giving control, um, I, I feel, um, I, fi I have problem agreeing with you because at the end of the day, your job is uh, screening out uh, so many requests from so many different journalists, right? As Peter said, if uh, the company people actually had to deal this deal with this all day, they, they wouldn't be able to do their job. So, um, and and as journalists, we will never be happy with just a comment from a PR <laughs> person. We always want the company's comment. So. Uh, how would you advise us to sort of get through your screening <laughs> to actually get uh, to the company people? Yeah, thanks. That's actually a really good question. And I guess also just to be clear, I almost never serve as the spokesperson for my clients. I have a very, at my company, we have a very firm belief that if you're dealing with the media, you need to talk to the media directly. So. I've only served a spokesperson once, and that was I was actually seconded to a client and part of their team for that. Um, but just like we have to do good pitches to you, you have to do good pitches to us. And while we may seem like a gatekeeper, I can tell you for a lot of the clients that I work with, a journalist wouldn't get through at all if they didn't have uh, someone who was holding their hand throughout the process. So yeah, are you going to have 100% batting average? No. But I hope and I like to think that instead of keeping people out, what we're doing is we're helping people get in who may not have had that access otherwise. We have a I'll, few more. I'll take that question just very quickly. When you go to a press conference, I think you can ask any question you would like to ask uh, as long as it's appropriate. Does that make sense? You don't ask them about, you know, but I'm sure you do that already. And then secondly, it's, it's part of your job as young journalists to develop your own sources. So you need to have your own ways of getting in, of getting information that's sometimes perhaps outside of uh, outside of the PR uh, conduit. We have a few more quick minutes, and the lady right here, and then we'll go to the back. Hi, I'm Lorraine from Burson Marstella. Um, I just have a really quick question. Um, I know a lot of Chinese, Japanese, Korean, you know, companies are really hard to reach, and um, so sometimes it's about building a relationship and then getting access to them. But then also, they also expect you to write you know, positive things, things that they want you to write about. So how do you balance you know, what your editorial team wants to write and how to you know, still satisfy them? I mean, you, just, you have a reputation for basically being accurate and, um, and kind of, you know, for being accurate basically and well-researched. And then you write it the way you want, the way you see it. I mean, I think I, I've seen so many news organizations kind of go down this route of kind of like, you know, doing the sort of the softball thing or the kind of like, you know, the soft soap interview and kind of, oh, we don't worry, talk to us, we won't ask you the, the, the hard questions. Um, it's, it's, it basically, it doesn't work because actually you get no respect really from, I mean, I mean as, as, as Jennifer said earlier, these people are also consumers of media, you know, when 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 the, when when the magazine that kind of you know bigs people up and puts them on the cover of the magazine says oh we want to big you up and put you on the cover of the magazine they kind of go well okay but actually look at the people they put on the magazine the cover of the magazine before I mean there's an element of sort of 
I think I think I think news organisations are their own worst enemy sometimes in terms of undermining themselves. I think you you, know, you have to be prepared. You have to do your homework. You have to ask the right questions, and obviously you have to kind of like build relationships with people and stuff, and kind of you know make sure they understand where you're coming from. But then you just have to basically you just have to be straight. You have to do your job. You have to do your job, and you you should try always do it in a very fair, accurate, and transparent way. So don't mislead them into thinking you're going to give them a glowing write up when you when you aren't. Um, but you work for person. So you're asking for yourself, working. But if you work for Burson, I, I would think it's part of your job to also manage the client's expectation. Yes, of course, definitely. And, and to be very clear with them, uh, you know, that this is this is the scope of the story. Yeah. This is what this yes. is what they're doing. Yes. Uh, please don't expect this. You'll be yes. sorely disappointed. <laughs> and if you're really upset and you want me to yell at them, well, it's, it's your decision whether or not you do that. <laughs> I wouldn't. Right. I wouldn't if I were you. I wouldn't. We have. Because, because no, you're probably going to have to deal with that journalist again at some other time. And if you want them to pick up your phone call the next time for a different client, I wouldn't be too heavy handed. We have time for one more question to end. There are a couple hands. So uh, uh, there is one in the middle, right? There are two, two hands up. And then let's see if we can. So I just had a, uh, a comment. I used to work here in Hong Kong as well. And uh, I would get a lot of pitches and uh, you know, hang out with the PR people. And uh, one thing that I noticed is uh, when they pitch to clients to get companies to sign up for their services, uh, their, their value proposition is, is if you hire us as PR people, we'll get your stories placed, and then you don't have to advertise in these publications. And uh, that was very frustrating for me because, um, you, know, I, I, um, you know, I had this one PR uh, lady say, you know, there's, there's hardly any tech media anymore. They're all closing down. And I was thinking, well, that's because of you, because you go around telling people that you don't have to advertise with these publications because you can just hire us and, uh, and get a story placed. Um, so, I mean, how do you, what's your value proposition to the, to the clients? Well, um, why don't we make it quick and then, yeah, go. Um, I think what Jennifer mentioned before about, um, about telling your story, I, we don't, promise clients um, specifically that, at, at least not at, at Bell Plunger, that's not what we do. Like, we don't promise them like certain coverage that they will get. That's not, because like, yeah, as you know, you can't, you just can't, right? Um, so what we, we do tell them is that uh, we will raise profile of their company, uh, get their story, and we want to make sure, of course, that they have a good story to tell. And in fact, as we, we assess our clients to ensure that they actually have an interesting story that they want to tell. Um, so, yeah. All right. Um, can, I, I, can I just can sure. I come in on that? Because I, I, I think this is actually, this is kind of the key sure. here to, to this discussion and also what happens from now on. I mean, you're right. The relationship is essentially one of a parasite and a host. In a, in a, I don't mean in a pejorative sense. I mean in, sort of in a scientific sense. The public relations industry exists because there is a media business which kind of needs it to a certain extent. And the, 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 at least to a certain extent, the money that goes to hire corporate communications consultants, public relations firms, etc., is money that would otherwise have been spent on advertising. And at a certain point, people said, actually, why should we spend money on advertising when we can spend, you know, for the cost of a page in the newspaper, we can hire someone for a year, if they get us a couple of sort of you know decent stories, then actually that's much more valuable than than than, than advertising. Um, and obviously, that relationship kind of breaks down if the host becomes ill, which is kind of what's happening at the moment. But I think I think we're actually we're moving beyond that now. We're moving to a world where um, the the sort of the, the relationship is almost breaking down on both sides. So on the one hand, you have uh, you have you have this this idea of sort of you know, telling stories, placing stories, kind of pitching ideas. It doesn't work because in social media, those things get killed instantly. When people spot something that's dishonest or wrong or kind of basically missing a point of view, people just, you know, the immediate reaction is to say, well, this is ridiculous. I'm ignoring it or I'm going to, or I'm going to, I'm going to pro propel it onto social media with my comment that says, look how ridiculous this thing is. And so that whole idea of the sort of the softball interview or whatever is, I, th I think, in a, in a social media world, I think that becomes very hard. But the flip side is that these organizations don't, don't need us as much as they used to. 
you know, in the old days when, when there were a certain number of publications and there were a certain number of, 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 of broadcasters, they had to go through us to get their point of view across. There was, a, there, was a, there was a need on both sides. Now, they just, you know, they kind of, they can put up a website, they can put a video on YouTube, they can get someone to write a bit of thought leadership, you know, kind of uh, content and put it on a, on a friendly website somewhere. So there's an element to which, to which you know, on the one hand, the, the, the news media has been empowered to basically just say, this is nonsense. But on the other hand, I think also, organizations have been empowered to basically bypass the news media altogether. So I don't know quite how that plays out, but I suspect probably in 10 years' time, we won't be having this kind of conversation anymore. It will be completely different. Well, and unfortunately, we've run out of time, and the panelists will hope we can stay and continue the conversations. And this is just getting, this is just the beginning, the end of the discussion and panelists, but the beginning of a larger discussion. So um, let's give a warm hand of applause to all the panelists, and thanks for the time and insights.